So we're out on the road again. This is our first trip since lockdown started, our first trip since the restrictions have been lifted. It's late July and we have come to Kinloch which is a very central part of Scotland, very central highlands. And uh, even more central than that, we've just been climbing the Shehalian mountain. This is the path that we're on at the moment. And if you were to draw a box around Scotland from its northernmost point to its southernmost point and its west and its east, and then find the centre point of that box, it would pretty much be slap bang on top of the Shehalian mountain. And I thought it would be a really nice idea to start this video by going to the top of the mountain and then panning round about and pointing out all the places that we're going to be visiting over the next few days round about the country. Whoops, Kinloch ran up here. But um, when I got there, it was just a bit too windy, the camera was going all over the place and you probably wouldn't have heard what I was saying because there was a, a sturdy 40 a mile an hour wind blowing across the summit. I might stick the wee video that I did on at the end and put wee markers on just to point out some of the places that we'll be visiting uh, as you watch this video later on. The other thing with the Shehalian that uh, I'll mention quickly, I'm not going into detail, was that in 1774 it was used for a scientific experiment to work out the mass of the Earth. Now, if you're into physics, and I am a wee bit, it's quite an interesting thing how they did it, and when you understand the experiment, you understand why they picked this particular mountain to do it. But I don't think you want to listen to a physics lecture from me, so I'm going to skip all of that, and I'm just going to cut straight into taking you on a tour around the Kinloch Rannach area and showing you the smaller tourist attractions that you could visit. As always, I'm not really focusing on the more uh, popular and better known tourist attractions. I'm going to show you the wee places that um, most folk tend to miss because they're not in the travel guides or if they are in the travel guides, they're kind of difficult places to find. So anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the video and uh, yeah, we'll take you on from there. So now we're hiking out to a place called McGregor's Cave, um, meant to be a hideout place for Rob Roy McGregor. Um, I'm not sure if that's actually historically going to be true or not, kind of a hard thing to prove, but uh, I imagine it's much like Outlander is today. People watch Outlander and they want to go and visit places that have Outlander connections and back in the Victorian times, Sir Walter Scott, incredibly popular Scottish novelist, he wrote his novel about Sir, uh, about Rob Roy McGregor and that no doubt created a whole Victorian tourist industry so some local entrepreneur must have thought I can get the Victorian tourist trade to come here if I call this Crave McGregor's and um, yeah, it's in a beautiful setting anyway it's well worth the work even if it hasn't got any historical connections to Rob Roy it's a beautiful walk through a woodland of old oak trees and some lovely Scots pines as you can see maybe up in the hills and uh, well worth it for the walk if nothing else it's only about an hour out and back I mean uh, an hour's walk round trip and uh, here comes the tricky bit we've got a wee river that we'll need to cross um, I'll probably have to put the camera away to do this and then I'll show you what the cave's like when we get to it hopefully see you soon 
So here we have it. The McGregor Cave, where Clan McGregor used to hide out when they were being, or when they were, outlawed, when the name McGregor was, was banned because they were such bad boys. So, story goes, the clan would come and hide here. But, ooh, it's tight. It's actually been modified by the Victorians, so it's got a bench in here. I don't think that shows up in the camera. Well, maybe. So there's a bench. They've put a cobbled roof in, so they've obviously adapted it. They put a window in, so it's a room with a view. These were all modifications that the Victorians made, obviously to make it a bit more of a spectacular attraction for the tourists, because um, I suspect the original cave was not really much more than just a, an overhang because they clearly have built pretty much an entire house on the side of it but it's a beautiful walk um, well it's going to take about half an hour of your time beautiful woodlands and across on the other side of the valley the valley, what am I saying? the loch and river tumble you can see Dunalister House Ruins which we shall be visiting later on today hopefully I'm going to go off tangent now and I'm going to have a little rant so please um, excuse me indulging myself with um, a bit of a whinge and the thing I want to have a whinge about is um, professional travel bloggers the guys who go all around the world and then they write these guides um, that say things like the ultimate trip in Scotland, the perfect 10 day itinerary around Scotland, the 20 best things you have to see in Scotland. You know, it's, it's all about must sees and little lists and like any country, Scotland can't be condensed into just a list of 20 things. There is no must see list, I would say, for Scotland. It, it, it doesn't do justice to the country. And the thing that I really object about these travel bloggers writing their, their must-sees or ultimate itineraries is the fact that they all tend to focus on the same places and as a result some parts of Scotland get over tourists um, I've done videos previously about the fairy pools on Sky, which is being destroyed by the number of visitors that are going to it and I think it's a real shame I would like to see tourism spread more evenly around Scotland and let me just show you this place this is um, the River Tummel down here and uh, we're walking in Perthshire, very central Scotland and it's a place that a lot of folk don't tend to think of as being the Highlands. I think a lot of people think Highlands starts at Inverness or something but it doesn't actually start much further south. So we've got this lovely countryside and um, I think it's as good as anything else in Scotland. I would certainly say this is one of my favourite places but I don't think any ultimate guide to Scotland has ever said do the walk to McGregor's Cave come and visit um, Kinlochanach or any of these things it's not a place that is on a mainstream tourist trail and it just kind of shows you why these ultimate guides always have to be taken with a wee bit of a pinch of salt um, and the other problem of course is and I understand it, these guys they make a living out of doing this so they have to visit lots and lots of different countries and they may be only in Scotland for 7 days or 14 days and a place like this is not a mainstream attraction, it's not an obvious thing to do, it doesn't have the wealth of history of places like um, Stirling Castle and by all means do Stirling Castle, it's good but uh, it's out of the way and you would only know about these places if you lived in Scotland and had the time to uh, stop and explore so anyway, that's my rant over, I just wanted to say when you read these ultimate guides to Scotland, please take them with a pinch of salt there is not really any must-see list for Scotland, I wouldn't say there's any perfect itinerary um, there's just lots of different things and it really depends what you want to see and what your interests are. This is a little thing and very easy to miss when you're in the Kinlochranach area because it's not signposted at all from the road. Which is the chapel building in the distance that you can see there, what, what's left of it. Um, that's not all 6th century but the original chapel was built in 590 AD they reckon. Um, it retains elements of the original chapel but most of that is a later, a later construction. What is interesting about the graveyard is this stone here which has, I don't know if you can see it terribly well, a Catholic cross on it but a Catholic cross with these circular cutouts 
where the cruciform was made. They reckon this is a 9th century cross. Um, there's no information boards anywhere here, there's not really much more that we can tell you about it, but it's an interesting little graveyard. There's a more interesting graveyard in some respects further in up at uh, Loch Ranach, which is to the west of where I'm stood at the moment. And at Loch Ranach, you have a grave called St Michael's, sorry, a graveyard called St Michael's graveyard. And the interesting story behind that graveyard is that there is a stone just outside the graveyard called the Clach de Cian, which stands as the Gaelic for Stone of the Head. And it gets its name from a very gruesome incident when we had Ewan Cameron, who lived here with his very attractive wife, Marsali. And Marsali was fancied by the leader, the chief of Clan Macintosh from Glenloy, which is way over towards Spin Bridge direction, across the, across the moors from here. And uh, the chief of Clan Macintosh thought he would come here and he would bop Ewan Cameron on the head and adopt Marsali for himself, because he really fancied Marsali. So he came with his men to Ewan's house up at Loch Ranach. And Ewan was out on the hills, whatever he was doing. So he went to Marsali and he asked Marsali where Ewan was, and she refused to tell him because obviously she sensed that something bad was going to happen. So he took one of her sons and he smashed his head against this stone of the head, Clachnachian, and killed the boy. She still refused to tell him, because she didn't want him to kill Ewan. So he took two more children and smashed their heads, two more sons, and smashed their heads on the stone, and killed them. And finally he got to her fourth and youngest son, and at this point she said, Look, I will go with you, I will be your wife, just don't kill Ewan and don't kill my youngest son. So off she went with uh, the chief of Clan Macintosh and the Camerons came back from the hills and they found out what had been going and they chased after the Macintoshes and Ewan actually died in the process of the, the, the pursuit that followed. So Ewan and his three sons are buried at St Michael's graveyard which is, as I say, further along this road. It didn't all go in the favour of Clan Macintosh though because the Camerons did all gang together and they burnt down Castle Loy which was the Macintosh castle, and there's no remnants of that castle at all. So, not exactly a happy ending, but there was revenge. And uh, that's me. This is Saint's Chapel. If you want to find it, that's the gate to look for. But do watch out, because it's a very steep hill. This is another wee gem that's just uh, five miles, probably not even that, four miles, three miles, to the east of Kinloch Finnish village. If you're following the road on the north side of Dunalister Reservoir, back towards Tummel Bridge. And it's quite hard to find. It's not signposted, um, there's no car parking spaces for it. But this is Dunalister House. Now, I kid you not, it's a massive mansion and it's just literally yards from where I am. So I'm going to walk up to the house, let you experience it the way you would find it if you're actually here yourself. Um, because it's it's quite surprising, it's big and it's been abandoned. I'll tell you more once we get up to the house, about the house itself. So I'll put a wee picture into the video at this point to let you see what the entranceway to it is like, maybe help you find it. And then just as you walk down this path, all of a sudden, here it comes. It's totally derelict. It has been derelict since Oh, well I'll give you the full story. The house itself was built on the site of what was a Clan Robertson castle. This is Clan Robertson territory. And then in the mid-1800s, around about 1850, 1860s, uh, the house, the land got bought by a Mr MacDonald and he was the commander-in-chief of the British Army in Scotland. And he knocked down the original castle and he built this slightly spooky looking I suppose gothic architecture is how you would describe it this house considerable expense and he lived in it as his grand country house and all was going well until the first world war came and after the first world war there was a whole disruption the amount of men that were available to work in the land was depleted people didn't want to work for the upper classes any longer, there was a whole social change going on. So after World War One, 
fantastic house, so I'm not really giving you the full appreciation. After World War I, he struggled to get a workforce to maintain the estate and it somewhat ceased to operate as the grand country house that it had been originally and it fell into a state of disrepair and then in World War II the house was requisitioned and it was used as a home for Polish schoolboys perhaps the children of Polish soldiers that had escaped I don't know the full history behind that but it, it became a school for Polish schoolboys oh someone's chopping down trees chopping down trees behind us so we'll have to watch out for that and then it became a girls school and as is often the case with girls school the building got trashed absolutely trashed so in the 1950s the building was pretty much derelict all the valuable stuff had been removed and then it caught fire and after it caught fire in the 1960s it got vandalized and stripped of everything leaving it as you see today spooky but magnificent When you're in the Kinloch Rannoch area, one village that you really want to make time to visit is Fortingall. Now, it is one of the prettiest villages, I would say probably in all of Scotland. Um, it's a charming place. The houses are all of a very consistent style and you find thatch roof cottages here as well as a more traditional style of houses. But the interesting thing with the village is, it was actually a bit of a dump up until the... Uh, late 1800s early 1900s and then the whole village was redeveloped by the local laird who was somewhat disappointed by living next to such a a, a, <laughs> a downtrodden village so he had the whole place redesigned in this lovely arts and crafts style the church is more original than the rest of the village but the Fortingall hotel which you can see in the background there is all designed by the same architect who, as I say, used this lovely arts and craft style that was very popular, sort of right about the same time as Charles Rennie Macintosh, although there's no Charles Rennie Macintosh uh, style influences that you can see in the houses. But the thing that you really come to Fortingall for is this. It's the Fortingall U. Now, there's various theories about how old it is, but it's certainly a very old tree, more than 2,000 years old. Some folk even estimate it could be 5,000 years old. So it predates the Roman invasion, um, predates Jesus Christ and all the other important landmarks. And as you walk up to it, they have done this nice path that tells you the history that you're passing through, that this tree has seen. Now the actual tree, apparently at one stage, they say had a girth of 56 feet, 17 metres. Quite a huge tree at one point. I assume when they say the girth, they mean the actual branches from side to side. And then unfortunately the souvenir hunters came and they chipped away at the tree and because it was such an enormous thing they came and they took bits of bark away. So what we're left with now is somewhat depleted in form but on the ground you can maybe make out in the camera there's little wooden markers all the way around the tree that show you what is meant to have been the original girth of the tree before the souvenir hunters came and chipped away at it. So anyway they now have the whole tree protected in this little enclosure. <laughs> Worth a visit. Um, I'll try and take some more pictures of Fortingall Village just to let you see how pretty it is. If not, I'll just put some stills in. Um, but there's more to show you in Fortingall. So these are some of the pretty houses I was telling you about in Fortingall with our thatch roofs. And that's the Fortingall Hotel that I was pointing out before. And in the trees there, you have the old church at Fortingall. But there's a dark side to Fortingall as well, as is the case with most Scottish places. And this is the Cairn of the Dead. Now, Fortingall is in a remote location in Glen Lyon, but despite its remoteness, it still fell victim to the Great Plague. And this cairn marks the burial spot. It's quite a spooky and quite a thought-provoking thing, because underneath this cairn is a mass grave of plague victims. All the plague victims when Glen Lyon were gathered together and the story goes that it was an old lady was given the job because I guess her life expectancy was lowest and she had the least 
to lose, well that was the thinking. And apparently they gave her a horse and cart and a white horse, don't know if there's a significance to the white horse. And she took the horse and cart round the villages of Glenlie and all the communities and the dead plague victims were brought out and then they were brought here and tipped into this mass grave. I don't believe it's ever been excavated, and it's not something I would like to think about doing, but this little marker stone for the cairn of the dead, as you call it, marks this, this mass grave. A sombre thing, but let's go back to a nice picture of Floating Gull Hotel, because it's also got a very good pub called the U Pub, which is a place I strongly recommend. It's got a lovely big fireplace in it, and um, well worth uh, stopping there for a pint. I brought you now into Glen Lyon, which is just beyond Fortingall. Well, technically Fortingall is in Glen Lyon, but this is the road that takes you deeper into Glen Lyon to a little village called the Bridge of Balgain. It's a lovely road, and they describe Glen Lyon, or Sir Walter Scott even, described Glen Lyon as the longest and loveliest and loneliest... Actually, I got that the wrong way round. Start again. It's the longest, loneliest and loveliest Glen in Scotland, and it has, you know, I think it's a fair description of it. It's certainly a very fertile glen. It used to be a glen where a lot of the Scottish kings would come and do their hunting. But the particular reason I've suggested that you come here is for this one lovely little scenic spot. There's a bridge here, and it's known as the Roman Bridge. It's not far from Fortingall. You go through Fortingall, you drive... You, if you're heading west from Fortingall, you come to a Y junction, and you would turn right to go towards Bridge of Balgay. And then if you keep looking on your left hand side as you're driving along the road, you'll see through the trees this wonderful spot. Now I'm going to go down and hopefully you can start to see it coming through. I'll have to go down to the water's edge for you to see this. There you go. There's a fantastic waterfall behind it. It's looking good because we've had some rain overnight and it's this lovely old pack horse bridge, but much like the one in Carbridge, but smaller. And uh, very easy to find, so, well, if you know what you're looking for. So if you're in Fortingall, do drive out the bridge of Balgay Road, maybe head along the road about three miles, look on your left-hand side and you'll see and find this great little picnic spot.